Hi, this is Bruce Muffson, Sonage of Nevada, LCSW, right at you with another song from another artist. His name is Mac Miller, and as everyone knows, unfortunately, about two months ago now, September 7th, he passed away from a overdose. Now, he did some tremendous things in music, and I'm going to cover a song from his last album, and the song has so many parallels about his life and so many interesting asides that I'm going to get right into it and go from there. Okay, here we go. What interested me about Mac Miller was how talented he truly was, and so many of these artists, they can do anything. Um, a guy I covered two songs ago, Triple uh, X, he, he taught himself several instruments. I mean, self-taught is amazing to me. Um, what did Mac Miller do? Self-taught self musician, played piano, guitar, <laughs> drums, and bass, all on his own. I mean, phenomenal. Um, his personal life was filled, unfortunately, with tremendous issues with drug usage. And one of the things that was really uh, prevalent in his life was at one point in 2012, um, 2013, 2012 and 2013, is that he was addicted to a thing called lean. Um, which is a combination of promethazine and codeine, and known as the purple drank or again lean. Um, he began taking to, to deal with the stress of a tour that he was on called his Macadelic Tour in 2012. In January 2013, he told a magazine called Complex, actually I don't know what even Complex is, I don't know if it's a media organization or a magazine, whatever, but he goes, I love lean, it's great, I was not happy and I was on lean very heavy, I was so blanked up all the time, that it was bad. My friends couldn't even look at me the same I was lost. And at the time of Miller's addiction, his buddy from childhood, thank God he had a friend from childhood, he made a comment. He said that I saw him in that mentality. I remember being in, like you're so blanked up because you feel like you used to, like you need to. I mean, he just was really, really a real mess. You're trying to get away from everything. For how much he was drinking, it's unbelievable that he stopped. Um, he quit taking it, thank God, in uh, the promethazine in November 2012 before he started the shooting of his reality show. Um, there's also a relationship with a singer named Ariana Grande where he dated her from August 2016 to May 2016. That's significant for another issue down the road, which I'll get into as well. Um, in 2018, he was arrested uh, for driving under the influence and he hit and had a hit and run and allegedly, again, allegedly crashing into and knocking down a power pole and fleeing the scene with two passengers. Police at the scene came, ran his plate, and blah, 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 came right to his house. Um, there's a, I want to get into that as well a little bit later. Finally, what happened? How did he pass away? Again, a young man, young man, 26. Um, he died of a drug overdose in his Studio City home on September 7, 2018. And on November 5th, just only um, basically uh, like a month and a half ago, um, 2018, the L.A. County Coroner's Office determined that he died from an accidental drug overdose due to a mixed drug combination of fentanyl, which is so deadly, alcohol, and cocaine. All right. There was another thing also about Mac Miller that he had done a show, not a show, he did like a, like a small movie about himself called Stop Making Excuses. In, the t in like the 12, 13-minute segment that this took, he's, he made a comment like halfway through about going to L.A. to do some shooting, and he said, it became toxic being by myself. You get bored. He said, I could get high and have a whole adventure in your own room. And then they also showed him using the lean, and he made a comment, I hate being sober. So the point is, is that he wasn't hiding how he felt. It was very, very obvious how he was feeling. He never really hit it. It's amazing to me, again, that people who were around him kind of saw things were spiraling out of control from his comments, the way he would say things. But again, again, and again, and again, I don't think anyone ever asked him, Mac, are you really, are you feeling suicidal? Because you seem really depressed. And until you ask those right questions, you don't go forward. And that's a real friend. You know, people say to me, what is a friend? What's a real friend? You know what a real friend is? I'll break it down real simply. 
A friend is uh, someone that does this to you. Holds you back from doing something stupid. That's it. I'm going to make my producer laugh because he's going to remember this story. We were in a house one time, and we were doing some assessments. It was like kind of like really easy, just throw in the blank kind of assessments, just bang, bang, bang. So I got a little bit bored. I wanted to screw around with the kids I was doing the assessments with. And he was sitting at the table with me, and I said to a girl, I said, I'm creating a club. She goes, what kind of club? I said, it's a friendship club. I want to be in it. And I said, well, you got to be nominated. She says, really? And I said, yeah. And she goes, well, how do you get nominated? I said, well, I'm going to be blue for boys and like pink for girls. And you get a bracelet. But you got to be nominated. And she goes, what do you got to do? What do you got to do? You got to do something for your friend. And she's like, wow. And I said, have you done anything special? And she said, I was a friend of mine in school, a girl. There was going to be a fight. And I didn't let her get into the fight. Could I get nominated? And I said, yeah. But I'm thinking like she's going to let it go. And she said, where do I go online <laughs> to get nominated? I want to wear a pink bracelet that says, I'm a real friend. And I had to like backtrack and, you know, I didn't say I was making it up. You know, I want to look like an idiot. But you realize people take that stuff seriously. And I've said this kind of stuff before and people always take me seriously and they're like, yeah, I want to wear a bracelet like that. I'm a real friend. Because a real friend does that. No, you're not. You're not going to do something stupid. You're not going to get into a fight. You're not going to start taking drugs. You're not going to get into some beef. You're not going to get kicked out of school. You're going to show respect to your coach because I'm your friend and you're too stupid to realize that's so I'm looking out for you. I'm a buddy of yours. In the military, in life, I'm looking out for you, dum-dum, because I care about you. And it could be a brother. It could be a sibling. could be a friend. could be a coworker. I'm looking out for you. And I don't think Mac Miller really had that. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I hope to God I'm wrong. But I, I never got that sense from walking all the videos that I watch, all that stuff. But he died alone, kind of depressing, 26. And you realize how many people go through life alone with nobody. No one to look out for him. Hey, Mac, I haven't heard back from you in two days. Where you at, boy? You're my man, you know? And you realize so much of this stuff that we read, you know, of course it's all fake, you know, on the internet or on TV where old people like me, the newspaper, it's so artificial. You know, we're family, we're a team, we love each other, we care. You realize it's so artificial. But I don't think he really had a real friend where he didn't have anyone friends from childhood. In part of the video that he did called Stop Making Excuses, he goes back to Pittsburgh and he talks about, he, he's seen going to like a neighborhood bowling alley and having a, like a traditional meat sandwich, whatever they were selling, serving. And he's talking to some kids, but I never got the sense he had people he really, really hung out with. And I felt bad for him. I really did, because I felt, what a talent, what a great musician. His songs were amazing. Um to end up like that, to die alone, taking fentanyl, which is such a potent drug. Ugh. Horrible. But he felt so bad about his life. Let's get into the song. Mac Miller, it's, com it's, called, sw it's called Come Back to Earth. It's from his last album called Swimming. And boy, whew, pulls no punches here. My regrets look just like texts I shouldn't send. And wait, you know, before I even start off, let me just back up a second. He released an album of jazz standards. That's how talented this guy was. It wasn't a rap album. And honestly, this song reminded me of jazz more than rap because it was so lyrical and how he, you know, uh, you know, my regrets. Again, I'm not doing justice to the song, but the way he sang it, the way the instruments were on the in instrument instruments on this were, I mean, like like there was like a flow to it, a certain like sophistication to it. 
This guy was so talented in so many ways. But this is not even a rap song. This could be on a jazz album and, and, and hold its own. That's the truth. So it goes, um, my regrets look just like texts I shouldn't send. And I got neighbors. They're more like strangers. We could be friends. You know what that tells me? He had nobody. Nobody. I have neighbors. They're more like strangers. Oof. What does it say about his friends? No friends. And then he says the most poignant lines of the of the whole song. I just need a way out of my head. I'll do anything for a way out of my head. It's such a metaphor in how he felt about his present and about his future and how he saw his life ending. You know, whenever I hear the word swimming or water, that to me is like a poster child for depression. Because when people say, I'm swimming, I'm swimming, I'm drowning, it's water. And so many of his songs, if I was going through all of his, a lot of his playlists, were related to water-based issues. He was in water. You know, he's sw- there's water around him. He's swimming. He's in a coffin. It's not just people. Let me clarify something about suicide and depression. People do how they feel. You don't think that they do, but they do. When you're angry, when you're shouting, when you're screaming at somebody, it's because you're feeling massively insecure. I don't. I I grew up in a, in a screaming ha- in a screaming family. My dad was a screamer, and I hated it. Till I got older, and I realized just how insecure he really was. Because people who have to scream at you, they have no confidence in themselves. If you're a real leader, you know you're a quarterback. You go into the huddle, and you got to be like, you know, blankety blank, 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 blank. By the second blankety blank, you kind of lost the whole situation while you're there. When I've heard people say to me, the guy came into the huddle and said, look, we're down to Ed, Philip Rivers last night. We're down two touchdowns. Don't worry about it. We belong on this field with them. They're the Chiefs. We're the Chargers. Don't worry. They're saying he's ice cold. He's, you know, man could do anything. Now, granted, he's a great quarterback, but he brought confidence to that huddle. Not a sense of panic. I got it. I got it. So, you know, it feels like you're slipping into water, the way he has that piano going on in the background. And very understated and see why he did release that jazz album because the way he puts lyrics together and the melodies is beautiful. And you just get the sense that he's in terrible pain and his suffering and the loneliness that he's feeling. So then he goes, in my own way, this feels like living some alternate reality. And I was drowning, but now I'm swimming. Ay, ay, ay. Same line. Drowning, swimming. What does that tell you? Suicide. I'm drowning in life. I'm drowning in death. I'm drowning in bills. I'm drowning in pain. I'm drowning in my mat. I get that. Drowning, and now I'm swimming. Oh, my God. And we, we, I've heard that so many times. Whenever you hear someone say that to you, that's a, that should be a red flag. I'm drowning, I'm drowning. I'm swimming. I feel like I'm in the ocean and I can't get out. That's a bad sign. Even the words give you, with, even without the video, that he's feeling this way, he's drowning. Or the things that I do to spend a little time in hell, and what I won't tell you, I'll probably never even tell myself, He can't face his own reality. I won't even be honest with myself and who I am because you know why, Bruce? It's too scary. I'll just go through all the motions. I'll smoke all the weed I can, get really, really paranoid from bad weed. I'll take on fentanyl and then, God forbid, car fentanyl. You know, I'll do alcohol because I don't want to deal with reality. That stinks. I don't want to deal with that stuff. I don't want to come back to Bruce. I hate that guy. You know, I've had I've had about dozens of encounters where people have said to me how much they hate me. They hate me. They said, I, I'm so sick you came today. We, I hate you. I hope you get into a car accident. I hope you die. I hate when I have sessions with you. You know what I say to that? I say, thank you. That's a wonderful compliment. Because so much of therapy, in my opinion, is a waste of time. 
and gets nothing accomplished. For someone to say how much they hate me, why, why thank you. <laughs> much appreciation. <laughs> Where I've had times where kids got so upset with what I was asking them, they turned to the parents in the room and looked that way out like this. Like this. Let's do this. And I say, don't look at your mother. Don't look at your father. Well, God forbid a father. But I say, don't look at your mother. Look at me. The question's at you. And the mothers inevitably say, don't look at me. You look at him. Answer his question. Because he wasn't asking me that question. He was asking you. And they're embarrassed. And that's where the anger comes out. Because they don't want to be put on the spot. Let's get out of here. Let's come late. Yeah, 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 yeah. I hate you. I had the pleasure one time a few years ago. I was walking through one of the units where I work. And the person said to me, I remember you. You're the guy with the thing on his head. I said, yeah. He says, remember me? I said, vaguely. I see so many people. And he said, I want you to know I hated you then. I hate you even more now. And I hate you so much because what you said about me happening, me coming back here was going to happen. And I did exactly what I shouldn't have done. And I thought of your words. I said, thank you. Now let's focus on you getting better so you don't come back another time. That's a compliment to me. When they hate you that much, wow, that's awesome. I actually made a dent in someone's coconut about looking at themselves with reality. No more swimming. So, when you're inside all day, when you're inside all day, he goes, I probably want to tell myself, and don't you know that sunshine doesn't feel right when you're inside all day? Yeah, inside all day, he meant his head. He couldn't leave his, he couldn't leave this. He was so unhappy. When you're inside all day, you're inside, you're trapped inside your head. I wish it was nice out, but it looked like a rain. Uh, more, 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 more weather metaphors. Gray skies. Ah, oh, here we go again. And I'm drifting. Oh, he, he's so he's so he's so clear to me. Not vague at all. Not living forever. They told me it only gets better. Who's they? Who told me? Yeah, my I, I believed. I believed. I believed. The next drug. The next pill. The next bottle. So pain and darkness is all he knows. He does not see any sun or clear skies. But look at that line. It's amazing to me. Sun here in three lines, no sunshine, looked like rain, gray skies, drifting. Four words in three lines, all referring to depression and suicidal thinking. And no one picks up on that. My re- and then he ends up with the last one. My regrets look like texts I shouldn't send. And I got neighbors. Okay, I just need a way out of my head. I'll do anything for a way out of my head. Okay. Just never had the sense that he was never close to anybody. That's the sense I got. Again, I'm hoping I'm wrong, but I just never got that sense of anything like that. To me, I need a way out of my head. It's a cry for help. There's no one around, and he was able to see how he was feeling, to see how, the, how Mac was really feeling and not coping. The drug and alcohol usage was simply a way to mask his unhappiness with himself. And you know what? The reason why I'm looking at the comments, bam, 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 bam. This guy was relatable to his fans. He he connected. I watched the concert video the footage. And see, that's a different animal. You can't fake that. And he would come across as real, as relatable, and people were like just excited to be at one of his concerts. And by all accounts, according to the interviews he had, he was a fun guy, great guy. Because he was one of them, because he never, he never had, he never hid from them. He was just himself. He exposed himself. Unfortunately, he never got help for himself. He exposed himself. He got naked for his fans. He didn't get naked for himself. That was the problem. And, you know, I want to talk about the video because the video was very, very interesting to me. All right? And there were so many things about the video. But here's what I want to say. Before I get, you know, I want to just clarify a few things I wrote down in my notes about him. This came from the Talko uh, uh, video show on YouTube. They talk about the breakup with Ad, uh, Adriana Grande, and it goes like this. She felt more like his mother than his partner and could not be responsible for his mental health. 
And while she loved him, the situation was emotionally devastating, which is what she claimed why they broke up. Okay, fine. Some of the comments that were made about him is that he was far more than the ex of Ariana. He was famous in his own right. Fans really loved him. There was an interview. Another comment was, um, this was quoted by uh, Cueto Rance. It said, he always played it off in interviews saying he's fine, but his music speaks volumes. Bingo. Excellent job. Thank you for saying that. Cueto, Q-U-E-D-O, Rance. He always played it off in interviews saying he was fine, but as music speaks volumes. Thank you for looking behind the curtain. Great job. Because all these interviews that he went on, I would watch. How you doing, Mac? How's the latest album? You you look good. You look courageous. You're you hanging in there. You, I, I like what you're saying. I like how you're reaching out to people. No one ever brought up the concept of, are you suicidal? Are you depressed? Like, what's going on? I looked at your last uh, one of your home videos, and you didn't look good. How's the breakup he- affecting you? He brushed everything off. No one asked her the money question. And he was in an interview with Zane Lowe. That was the last interview, July 23rd, 2018. And he talked about driving home drunk. And he felt it helped him. Helped him? Clinically, what he was doing was he was preparing to kill himself. I'm going to go over that a little bit later. But he had to get the confidence to go through it, and that's the way Junior Seau did that as well. Junior Seau, uh, he's you know he's, he's with six years now. He was an NFL linebacker, great player, just recently in, in, inducted into the Hall of Fame. And he, what he had done, Junior Seau was in 2010, he had driven off a ravine of a hundred feet, and. Um, this happened in October 2010. He plunged 100 feet cliff, his SUV. And this is just right after he'd been arrested for domestic violence during an incident reported to police by his girlfriend. He said he fell asleep and at the wheel, and he was never formally charged with the DV. Okay, in 2012 is when he actually killed himself. He died of a gunshot wound on May 2nd, 2012. What I believe Junior say I was doing, and, just, and I've seen this in studies, is you've got to prepare yourself for suicide. You, it's very rare it happens the first time because it's got to be a confidence booster. That's why he drove. If you think about the timeline, May 2nd, he has a car accident. May, June, July, August, September. He had to prepare himself to get the confidence to kill himself. It's because very rarely, I mean, think about it. He drives into a telephone pole. Why? Because he was drunk. He'd been drunk before. Why didn't one of his buddies take the wheel? See, it didn't make sense, the whole story to me. And then he flees the scene. Well, what's going to happen? Of course, the cops are going to run the plate. Oh, Mac Miller, let's go to his house. Knock, knock, knock. He gets arrested. I believe he took that ride deliberately to see what it was like to crash his car into a tree, to a telephone pole, and see the impact. And then when he went to the side to finally do what he did, it gave him the confidence that he could be successful with it. Junior Sale did the exact same thing. And when he did it the first time, the sheriff's deputies, rather than saying to him, you need to go get a mental health evaluation, they took selfies and asked for autographs. You get it. To me, that's when he was really going downhill. Now, they, they say the split was very bitter, where it was, you know, it wasn't, it was amicable. Well, I shouldn't say it was bitter. It was not bitter, but it was, it was, it was amicable. They got along. They still love each other. That played an effect. I'm not saying it didn't play an effect, but that suicide attempt was building up. And they taught, he said, you know, he said, oh, you know, he goes, he he said clinically he was preparing to kill himself, had to get the confidence. We talk about this. And another comment by Martin Movies, M-O-V-E-S, he says, a self-destructive depressed drug user broke my heart for him to refer to himself like that. That's what he, that's what he called himself. Mac Miller said, I'm a self-destructive, depressed drug user during the interview. And the guy said, it broke my heart for him to refer to himself like that. Sad. People people realize that. And then Paul O1 said, why would he overdose coming from the place he's in from this interview? I'm unsettled with his passing. It's wrong. Yeah, because he wasn't in the right place. The interviews are just superficial. You're not getting to the meat. You're not going deep in how someone really feels 
when they're truly feeling suicidal. And he was, to me, he was relatable to his fans talking about his drug and alcohol issues and his struggle with mental illness. And even, see, there's another picture of him taken. As a, they, had, they had the photographer talking about his last photo of Mac Miller. So the photo, of course, the death happened, a few, I think, a few days later, three days later. It became a viral sensation. People actually got tattoos of that last photo. What's the photo? It's this. He's looking like this. He's hiding. Like, so obvious to me. It's not like, you know, hey. It's this. And the guy said he was gregarious, he was funny, he was helpful. But the way he came across was he had the picture of himself had to be, you know, protected. He was protecting himself. He didn't want you to see the real Mac Miller. Wow. Again, so so painfully obvious to me. Now, here's the thing I want to clarify about this in clinical notes I put down. Come back to Earth is so true. You know, he was lost in space. He wanted to come back to terra firma. He didn't know how to. And video was so expressive. It was only about two and a half minutes long. After watching that video, I'm, I'm actually touching the computer my <laughs> producer's using, um, and knowing his history now, if I was clinical and I was working with him, I would have had him admitted inpatient on a suicide precaution, honestly. Watching that video and hearing him talk, he would have gone in. On, the lyrics and the video, I'd say get him arrested. Call 911. I want him picked up. He's a danger to himself. I put him on suicide protocol. He's basically screaming, help me. Get out of my mind. Get get the thoughts of unhappiness out of my mind. Now, here are things about the video that I found so interesting to me at least. You never see him inside the suit. Just the flickering lights. He just drops. There's no end. He's dropping, 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 dropping. He has no control over the descent. Floats by the ground, shipwrecks. He could actually land, but he's drifting, 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 drifting. Reminded me of him going down the Marianas Trench, five miles down, just drifting, drifting, drifting. It just gets dark and darker and dark. Well, there's no sunlight. That's what he wanted. Just drifting, drifting in his head. It's no shock to me that he's the only human out there. He is truly alone. No one can get inside. And despite all of his success and, and genius, he was filled with the crippling doubts and insecurities. And that's so sad that he didn't have to feel this way. He could have gotten help for his depression. And it's clear to me he suffered from serious depression and anxiety and, of course, drug and alcohol abuse, which, to his credit, he talked about openly, but he wasn't able to get the help that he truly needed because he did suffer from depression, anxiety, clearly stress, and that affected him. And, of course, he turned to drugs and alcohol as a way to cope. And I guarantee he did not sleep well. Even in interviews, he talked so much about that he was all right when it's clear that he never was. That's why I talk about the listening. When people tell you something, it's always the opposite of how they're really feeling. I'm doing great, just great. No, you're not. I, I, I've never been more sober in my life. The new album is going to go great. Real translation, I'm drinking and drugging. I'm worried about the album. I'm stressed out of my mind. When people tell you something, always be careful of what they say and listen. Because if you have confidence in yourself, you don't got to say something. I don't need people to say to me, Bruce, you're brilliant in therapy. You're brilliant in counseling. I mean, I hear that. You know, it's nice to hear the compliment. But I'm at the point in my life that I don't feel confident about myself, about doing this field, that I shouldn't be doing it. If I have to tell people all the time to say, hey, do you really like what I say? You, you think I'm doing a great job? Do, am I doing a great job? That's telling me that you think that you're not doing a great job. That's massive insecurity. And unfortunately, that's what he had also. He was so insecure about being so successful as a musician. He was not just a rapper. He was beyond being a rapper. But he was insecure about that. He couldn't enjoy the success. And that's the thing I try and teach people is enjoy the success that you have. You know, 
that's something I, you know, when I make these videos, people say, like, you know, what is the ultimate gain? Well, we want to, you know, make the site successful, of course. But I love doing them. I love doing them. I can do them all day long because it's it's me. It's my creativity. It's my pulling together all the paperwork and blah, blah, blah. I love the creativity of what I'm doing. I could do this forever and ever and ever. The only great is I didn't do this 10 years earlier. But I love doing these things because I see that there's, a, there's potential here to help people get better. That's the ultimate goal anyway. But I love doing them. And I have total confidence when I do them. But I'm telling this to people out there is if you have that insecurity about yourself, you don't have to feel good about the moment, feel good about the situation, and enjoy the situation for what it is. Because so often we don't appreciate what we do have when things once in a while do go right. I'm so happy I'm here today doing these videos. Great. I'm going to go out into chaos. I fully expect that. <laughs> I'm not disappointed. I fully expect that to happen. My week's already shot. My weekend's already shot. I got tons of work at work waiting for me to go to work. But I'm okay with that because I've expected that in my life it's always going to rain. Big deal. But now in the moment, I'm here. I'm here. I got the chance to do the videos. That's what I'm trying to push to you guys from a clinical perspective. And go get the help if you need it. Don't suffer. There's a way out. We are at a 30-year high with suicides in America. 30-year high. You'd think, you'd think, you'd think with all the stuff that's out there that suicide would be dropping like a rock. Yet it's rising like crazy because people are so desperately unhappy. And unfortunately, Mac Miller was one of those people, and he didn't have to die the way he did because he could have been making music for the next 40 years. That guy was that talented. And I'm sorry his passing was, took place because he was a genius. So sad. And 26. And he made references. He didn't want to join the 27 Club of famous musicians that died at 27, like Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin, I think John, uh, John Belushi. He didn't want to be a 27 Club member. I think Kurt Cobain also. Died at 26. I beat it by a year. Great. If you need help, get the help. If these videos spark interest, which I hope they're doing, go seek out someone competent, someone reliable. But get the help. Don't suffer. Don't be self-abusive. And don't be self-destructive. You only have one life. Get the appreciation for it. And understand that. And, and again, from a clinical perspective, look at the signs. Look at the signs. And listen to the conversation. And if you hear of an overcompensation in one area, they're telling you they're having a problem in that same area. With that, I want to say thank you for watching. Appreciate it. If you want comments, 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 we love them. Enjoy. And thank you again from Sunridge of Nevada. This is Bruce Muffson, LCSW.